Uh, we left off on Monday with a discussion of optimal hedging, and uh, let me just pick up on that. Uh, so the idea here is, you know, we've been talking about hedging, where you take a position in the futures market that's opposite your cash position. Uh, another way to look at this uh, concept is to draw on portfolio theory from finance, and the basic uh, argument is that it makes sense to diversify. Uh, if you're studying finance and you're studying investments, it makes sense to diversify. You don't put all of your eggs in one basket. And um, the finance theory teaches us that diversification into different assets is beneficial, especially if those assets are negatively correlated. In other words, if they don't move up and down together. So if you're um, person that has all your money in the stock market, it might be good to diversify and, and hold some money in a commodities fund or invest in real estate. You invest in different assets that are not highly correlated. In fact, it's ideal to have a large negative correlation. Well, as you know, with futures markets, if you take a long position on one side and a short on the other, then the correlation will, will be negative uh, as long as the basis behaves reasonably and it could be quite high. So this is a, an ideal candidate for diversification, right? If you're long cash and short futures and the price rises, well, the return on the cash will be positive, return on the futures will be negative. Uh, it's completely uh, negatively correlated if the basis doesn't change, so it's an ideal candidate for diversification. So uh, therefore, when we set up our portfolio, we have um, a cash position, RC, and a futures position, RF. That just indicates the return on cash. You can view that as the price change, if you like. So it's a change in the price to the cash. So let's suppose we just have one unit, so it's one contract. So our return to the portfolio, we call it RH, is equal to the return on the cash position, whatever that is. It might be 10%, uh, minus H, where H is the hedge ratio. That's the fraction of the cash position that's hedged. So if H was 1, then the hedge ratio would be 100%. If H was 1, then the return on the hedged position would be equal to the return on the cash minus H times the return on the futures. And both RC and RF are unknown at this point, right? We're going forward, so we're putting together this portfolio. If H was equal to 1, as it has been in our examples, we're been trying to get it close to one, and the cash went up 10%, and the futures went up 10%. Well, because you're short futures, there'd be a minus 10% here, there'd be a plus 10% here, and the return on the hedge portfolio would be zero, right? So then you've el totally eliminated the effect of any price change because you have, you're long in one market and short in the other. So uh, th this is just a way of rephrasing the hedging problem that we've already looked at using portfolio theory. So that gives you the return on the hedged position. We then take the variance of that expression and we find that it depends on the, the variance of the cash, the variance of the futures, and um, the, the covariance between cash and futures. It depends how they move together, um, which makes perfect sense. Okay, And then the whole idea with um, Putting together a portfolio of futures and cash is that you're trying to minimize risk for a given return. Remember, we were looking at that risk return trade off, so you're trying to minimize risk for a given return. So we uh, have uh, the variance of the portfolio, which is the top equation, that's the variance. We minimize that by taking the first order condition and choosing H. In other words, it's H is the choice variable. What is the optimal hedge? Is it 100%, is it 50%, is it 80%? That's what we're trying to decide. And in order to minimize the variance, we take the first order condition, uh, differentiate it with respect to H, and then we solve for H star, which is our optimal hedge, and we see that it depends on the uh, covariance between uh, cash and futures and the variance of futures, which I indicated last time is uh, simply the regression coefficient if you re regress cash prices on futures. Um, but more importantly, let's rewrite this expression for the optimal hedge 
to put it in a more intuitive uh, framework. And I wrote down the formula for the correlation coefficient, which you'll remember from statistics. And we can substitute um, that into the optimal hedge ratio. And we find that the optimal hedge ratio is therefore equal to the correlation coefficient times the standard deviation of cash over futures. So uh, the optimal hedge will depend on the extent to which the cash and futures move together. If, they, if there's no basis risk, uh, then the correlation coefficient is 1. And obviously, the uh, standard deviation. Do you have your music on? I'm used to that. I have almost a teenager at home, so I, I picked it up. Um, thanks. <laughs> Um, so if you can see that if, if they're uh, moving in exact parallel fashion, then uh, sigma c will equal sigma f, right? And uh, rho, the correlation coefficient, is 1, so then the optimal hedge is 1. Uh, but that's not the typical situation. Usually uh, the, the uh, correlation coefficient differs in 1, and the, the uh, standard deviations will be different from one another. Sigma c will not equal sigma f which means that the H star could be different than 1, and typically it's actually less than 1 uh, in absolute value. So I'll show you this with a diagram, but before I do that, let me just review the assumptions that we have used to build up this model. We talked about a risk-averse hedger, and I defined risk aversion on Monday. We're assuming that you have a long cash position. We could rewrite the uh, expression and do it for um, a short cash position, it just changes the signs on things. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. But you do have a cash position, and you combine a short futures with, with the cash, which is a short hedge, as you know. So you long cash or short futures, and then you look at each portfolio, and the portfolios will differ from one another depending on uh, H star, right? If, if you set the optimal hedge equal to 1, then that's one portfolio. If you set it equal to 0.8, that's a different portfolio, and so on. And you evaluate each portfolio based on its uh, risk and return, which we're interested in because a risk averse hedger is trading off risk versus return. And we also assume that if you have a long cash position, um, in other words, it's unhedged, that will give you uh, a higher expected return. I mentioned when I wrote down that equation, we put the E in front of uh, RC, right? We don't know what the return is. But going into the hedge, you expect that there's some return on the cash position. And uh, I mentioned that if you set H equal to 1 and they're perfectly correlated, then expected return to H was 0, right? So if you have a cash position and a futures position, the basis doesn't change. Well, then you know that the profit on one side offsets the loss on the other and there's no return to the hedge. That's our whole story about uh, not having your cake and eating it too. If you're hedging, you forego the potential to profit from a favorable price change. So the return to the hedge is zero. Um, a return to an unhedged position, a return to the cash position, will be greater than zero, but it will also carry a high variance, so it'll be riskier. So that's, that fits with our um, earlier discussion of hedging. You could go unhedged, but then you have a, a much riskier position. Granted, it might have a higher expected return, and you might have someone that argues and says, no, we should be unhedged because we, you know, the price could go up. Well, it could, um, but it uh, has a higher variance. So uh, the whole idea is that hedgers are not speculating on price expectations. And we've talked about that before when we discussed the airlines, right? Um, Southwest Airlines runs a very good airline. They have very good pilots, very good staff. Their aircraft are well maintained. What they're not good at is forecasting the price of fuel. Okay, that's an oh, entirely different profession. And they're not good at that. Therefore, they tend to have an active hedging program. They're not into speculating on the price of jet fuel. And if they were, that would likely affect the value of their shares, and their shareholders might get concerned. So uh, that's an important assumption that we're making about all hedgers, is that they're involved in a particular business 
whether it's a farmer growing soybeans, it's an airline providing um, transportation services, you know, it's a bank that provides a multitude of services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, their prime business is not speculating on the price of uh, T bonds or the price of jet fuel or the price of soybeans. That's not their prime business. And for that reason, they use the futures market or the options market to hedge that risk. So um, we can now draw a picture of this portfolio model. Remember before we said um, that a risk averse hedger is interested in the trade off between return, so here's the expected return to the hedged position, so now it's combined futures and cash. This is the uh, variance of the hedged position, so this is the riskiness of it. And we could go 100% um, hedged, or we could go 100% uh, unhedged, which is zero hedged, um, and that will affect the portfolio. If we're 100% um, unhedged or zero hedged, we're up here, and that's where you're just holding the cash position. So it might have a high expected return, but it also has a high risk. So up at point U, you're unhedged. That's what U stands for, unhedged. So you're just holding the cash position. It has high expected return, but high risk. Down here at H, where I put it 100% hedged, H stands for hedged, you have low return, but you also have low risk, right? You have low risk, low return, so that's a different portfolio. So we could really think of a number of portfolios. There might be one here, where H is equal to 1. There might be one up here, where H is equal to 0. Uh, there might be one here, where H is equal to 0.5. So if we combine these different combinations of cash and futures, then we trace out this frontier, which is a risk return trade off of alternative portfolios. The shape of that frontier will depend on the, the uh, variance of the futures, the variance of the cash, and the covariance term. That's what gives you the shape of this frontier. So the frontier is determined by putting together these alternative portfolios. And now to choose our optimal hedge, we bring in the notion of risk aversion, and we choose a point where the indifference curve is tangent to that risk return frontier. Remember when we talked about risk aversion, we drew these upward sloping indifference curves uh, that indicates someone who's risk averse in order to take on uh, additional risk, they must earn a higher return. So the uh, indifference curve has uh, the slope shown here by this white line. So if we have the indifference curve I and the the frontier which provides risk and return for alternative portfolios, HU, then we find the optimal hedge at point H, which gives us a minimum risk for a given expected return. So that's H star. So graphically, that's where H star comes from. We saw the algebraic H star a few minutes ago. So this is the, the graphical counterpart. So basically, um, What's feeding into this is obviously the, the shape of the indifference curve. If we had a different uh, type of indifference curve, it was steeper or something like that, uh, or flatter, then you would have a different H star, right? And if the shape of HU varied because the underlying uh, variances and covariances varied, then obviously you'd have a different H star as well. So the H star depends on the underlying market parameters and the degree of risk aversion on behalf of the hedger. Okay? Any questions on the optimal hedge? Yes? When you calculate the variance for the future price, do you base that on historic prices or on the contract's price? You have to base it on uh, historical. It's expected variance, really. What you do in finance as well. And it's always tricky to uh, estimate the expected variance, and there, there, there's more than one way to do it, but 
you're right. Basically, you have to use historical data. You have nothing else. Okay, so the bottom line here is um, large corporations that are involved in hedging don't necessarily set H equal to 1. It can vary dramatically. Um, and it, it will likely range in some area below 1, but I've even seen situations where it's greater than 1. All right. Do you mind opening that door in the back? It seems like it's about 110 degrees in here, like a sauna. Thank you. Some of you have jackets on. God. <laughs> okay, you ready for options? So this is our last um, section in the course. Um, we're finished with futures. Now we move on into options, which is a very interesting uh, dimension. And as I say, it builds on what, what our knowledge base is with regard to futures, because the options are options on futures contracts. So I start off by explaining that in the economy, um, there are many option contracts, and you've probably heard about options on stocks. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about options on futures contracts. I give an example of um, an option in the economy, and uh, this is one I read about a few years ago, which is very interesting, where the U.S. military um, has an arrangement with some private air cargo companies in the U.S., like FedEx, FedEx and so on, where these private companies will uh, purchase these large cargo airplanes, and the military will, will pay an upfront fee. It's really an uh, option premium that they're paying to the company. And uh, their option is that in time of war, they could take use of that aircraft. Uh, if war doesn't break out and they don't need it, well, they don't exercise their option, and FedEx has just found themselves with some additional revenue that helps cover the cost of the aircraft. FedEx is better off because they can live without it given that the, the payment they're receiving, and the military is better off because they don't have to carry this large stockpile of aircraft. In time of emergency, they can go in and exercise the option. So that's um, one of many examples of options that we see in our economy. Now we want to focus on an option contract that's written on a futures contract. So for example, we've referred to the crude oil futures contract. There's an option pit that's next to the crude oil futures pit, and those traders are trading options on the crude oil futures contracts. So the option, as the name implies, gives you the right as a buyer to a futures position, but not the obligation. So the, the uh, risks are much different for an option buyer than the buyer of a futures contract. If you buy a futures contract, then you're obligated to either take delivery or uh, ex accept this, the uh, settlement price uh, during expiry if it's a, a non-deliverable contract. But with an option, if you buy the option, you have the right to obtain a futures contract, but you're not obligated to obtain it. You don't have to take it if you don't want to. Um, so each option will have a strike price. Um, it will have a premium that's set in the pit, and it will be attached to a particular futures month. For example, December crude oil. You know about December crude oil. You know that December futures price for crude oil is set in the pit. So you look at that price, let's say it's $30 a barrel, and you know what that means. In addition to that, there's an options pit where you can buy either call or put options. A call option is the right to go long in futures. A put option is the right to go short in futures. That option would specify a strike price, and that's the price at which you would go long or short. So the exchange will set 
a range of strike prices. So right now in crude oil, those strike prices might range from $25 to $35. So you've got a range of strike prices. That's the entry point where you'd either obtain the long or short position. And it would be attached to a specific month, let's say December. So there's a trading pit in the options where they're trading call options, which is the right to go long. And let's say the strike price that you're interested in is $30. The futures price is now $30. We say that that option is at the money because the strike price is the same as the futures price. So if you thought the price of oil was going to rise in the next few weeks because of what's going on in the Middle East, uh, you could certainly go out and buy futures contracts, um, and you know how to do that. Alternatively, you could buy a call option, and the option would give you the right to obtain a futures contract at the strike price, and let's say the strike price is $30. So then you'd be buying the right to go long at 30, and let's say that's also on December. So you're buying the right to go long in December. So you know full well that if you bought a December crude oil futures contract at $30, and uh, then all of a sudden uh, the military situation in the Middle East settles down, the price of oil also settles down. It drops from 30 to 20, uh, and you, you've gone long at 30, well, you're going to lose a lot of money, right? It's a thousand barrel contract. So you go long futures, the price falls, you're going to lose money. If you buy the call option, then you're buying the right to go long at 30. But if the price falls to 20, well, I mean, who wants to be long at 30, right? If the price is 20. So what do you do with that option? It's now December 1st. Hopefully you have a fireplace at home, right? You burn it. You throw it away. You don't want to go long at $30 if the price is now $20. So in order to obtain that right to go long at $30, it's not as though you can burn something that you didn't pay anything for. It's like, you know, it's like burning um, some new $20 bills. You had to pay the premium at the time. So today's date is November 12th, right? So today on November 12th, uh, there's not much time left between now and December. Chances are you could pick up that option for, um, I would guess, I haven't checked the markets in the last few days. Uh, you could probably buy it for a, a dollar a barrel or maybe $1.50 a barrel. So you would pay, let's say it's a dollar a barrel to keep it easy. You'd pay $1,000 per contract for the right to go long at $30 a barrel. Okay, so the strike price is $30 per barrel. The delivery month is December. You know it's a thousand barrel contract. The premium is maybe a dollar per barrel. The premium is determined in the trading pit. All those other factors are set by the exchange, right? Um, the exchange sets a range of strike prices, as I say, depending on where supply and demand is. Um, the delivery month is set and obviously the size of the contract. So you go into the trading pit and uh, <coughs> if you want to buy this option, you have to pay the price that the market is asking. So there's a bunch of people in the pit that are willing to sell the options. You're a buyer, they're sellers. Wherever you meet, that's the premium. So you buy that today for a dollar. Anytime between now and the first week in December, you could exercise it, which would give you a long December contract at $30 a barrel. Or you could sell that option if you like. If the premium rises to $2 a barrel because the price of oil has gone up, well, then you could turn around and sell it if you want to. Or if the price falls, then the, the value is going to fall below a dollar, 
And as we approach expiry, if the price is below $30, then the value is going to fall down to zero. It's going to be worthless. That's why you put it in your fireplace. Yes? Monthly or just a one, one, one shot. shot? One shot. So the question is, do you, do you pay more than once? No, you just pay once, and that's why options are preferred by some speculators because you know that if you went out and bought December crude oil futures, you'd have trouble concentrating on your classes, and right? Because you'd be worried about what's happening to the price. And you know, if the, if the price goes down, I'm going to lose a lot of money and all that stuff. But if you buy an option, you pay an upfront premium, and that's it. That's the most you can lose. So in this case, if it's a dollar a barrel, the most you can lose is a thousand dollars. End of story. And you pay that initially. If I'm the seller of the option, I sell you the option for a dollar. You pay it to me immediately. Now I'm on the hook as a seller. The risks for the seller are much different because uh, as a seller, I am obligated to provide you the long position if you exercise the option. Right? So you're buying the, the right to go long at 30. Suppose the price jumps up to 40. Well, you're probably going to exercise the option. You want that long position at 30. So I get a call from the clearinghouse that says, um, by the way, that option you sold has been exercised. Uh, we need to provide um, that trader, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah. With her, she wants to be long at 30, so we have to give her a, a long position at 30. And you know the way the clearinghouse works, they can't give Sarah a position at 30 if they don't assign somebody else the other side of the market. So guess who gets a short position at 30? It's me, because I sold you the option. So Sarah gets a long position at 30, I get a short position at 30, the price is now at 40. So you can see the seller of the option is exposed to more risk here, but the sellers are also very uh, smart people and you know uh, they want to put bread on the table too so they don't sell options for less than what they think they're worth so they're also calculating the probabilities of where these prices are going and that's how they come up with a dollar a barrel yes I'm sorry if I took too long if you buy this option yes the one over here the yeah Okay, so the question is, um, if Sarah bought the option from me, and uh, then she ended up throwing it in her fireplace, how does the clearinghouse settle that out? Well, uh, once she buys the option, uh, she has the right to two things, either exercise it uh, before the expiry date, okay, or, or resell it. So uh, the clearinghouse would not be involved unless she um, invokes one of those two possibilities. Um, and as far as the clearinghouse is concerned, she has paid me the premium, so I'm happy. And the only thing the clearinghouse then keeps an eye on going forward is they don't worry about Sarah, they worry about me. And if the price starts to rise and they know that I've shorted or sold a, a call option at $30, then I'll get margin call. Okay. And that protects Sarah. So uh, the clearinghouse would, unlike in futures, of course, uh, the clearinghouse only asks for margin call from one of the traders and if the price goes one direction. So the sellers of the option uh, must pay uh, margin calls if the market moves against them. And it's just like futures, the margin call would be equal to the dollar value loss and the and then that's to protect the buyers of the options because it, when Sarah exercises it, she wants to know that, that she will acquire the long position at $30. The only way they have guarantee that I will honor my commitment is, is if I have provided margin call all along. There's a question over here somewhere. Yes? What's the strike price? The is strike? That, the is that like the cash price or the market price? The question is, what is the strike price? So. Um, you know, you have these different delivery months. So for every delivery month, we're talking about December here. For every delivery month, the exchange will post a list of strike prices, and you can trade options at those strike prices. And the strike price is the price at which Sarah would obtain her, her 
um, long futures position. Okay, uh, it's it could be different than today's futures price. The example I used was um, thirty dollars a barrel, and I just set it equal to today's futures price. But she might buy an option with a strike of um, twenty-five. Okay. Now, how much do you suppose that would cost her? Would it be more or less than a dollar? The futures price today is thirty bucks for December. Sarah's buying an option to go long at twenty-five bucks. Is that going to cost more? More? How much would you sell it to her for? If you're in the pit. Pardon? Five is minimum. Yeah. So what, how much you want? I'm waiting. Six, seven, eight dollars. All right. That's that's good. Seven dollars. Something like that. You know, I might sell it to her for six. So, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Um, how long do you typically have the option for as long as the uh, futures contract exists? Uh, yeah, the question is do you typically have the option for the same length of time as the futures contract exists? For most options, they expire uh, before the actual futures contract. And again, it varies by exchange and by contract and whatever. But typically, they might expire a week or ten days before the uh, end of the uh, calendar month. Okay, so in December, crude oil on December might expire, you know, around Christmas time, and the option might expire around the twentieth or something like that. But every everyone's a little bit different. Yes. And if there's more time between the settlement date. Question is, does the premium change if there's more time between the settlement date? Which is a good question. Okay, so. We have um, December crude oil, okay, and we have uh, let's say June crude oil, okay, and let's say the futures on December are thirty bucks, and on June they're uh, let's say thirty-two dollars, okay. Uh, you know what I could do. Just to answer your question, is let's just keep it the same, okay? And uh, then there's a strike price here, and Sarah's buying this at a $25 strike, and let's say that this is a $25 strike as well, and I might sell her this for six dollars, okay? The difference between the futures and the strike is five dollars, and that's called intrinsic value. And we'll learn a lot about intrinsic value in a few minutes. Um, so your question is: the only difference here is uh, time to maturity, right? So if Sarah wants to buy a June call option, she wants to buy a June call. The strike price is 25. The futures is 30. Uh, would anyone, in their right mind, sell it to her for six dollars? Five dollars. Seven. You in the blue hat? Okay. How much? I think that's a rational thing to do. There's more time between now and June, and so there's more uncertainty, as you said. So the answer to your question is typically the more time to maturity, the higher the premium. Everything else constant. And that's called time value. Okay, so the question is, given that the option is uh, a cheaper alternative to buying futures contracts, is that built into the premium? 
But, but actually, as we'll learn uh, in a week or two, um, there's really no free lunch here because if you buy a futures contract, uh, you don't pay a premium. I mean, all you pay is a small brokerage fee. So actually, you're getting more leverage there with a futures contract. If you're buying an option, uh, you've paid the premium and that's gone. You don't get that back. You know, in Sarah's case, you know, if she's paying a $6 premium, um, then even if the price goes up to 31, uh, she's still just breaking even, right? So it has to go to at least 31 before she breaks even. Whereas if I just bought a futures contract outright and it went from 30 to 31, I would have made $1,000. So she's down $1,000 before she starts because she has chosen to buy an option instead of a futures contract. So the premiums uh, do vary, as you can see just with our examples, depending on supply and demand and, and options on futures have a much shorter history than futures contracts themselves. Options on futures have, have really only been around for 15 or 20 years. They were traded 100 years ago, but there was some controversy and uh, they were, the trading was stopped. So once we saw the introduction of options on futures, for five or six years the premiums were really high. Uh, but they've been coming down and they're, you know, it's a lot more competitive than it used to be. But, uh, Especially if you're looking at a, at a highly volatile market like crude oil, uh, you'll pay some pretty high premiums. So the, the, the plus is that um, Sarah knows exactly her maximum loss. The most she could lose is the premium. But on the other hand, um, the price will have to increase by a certain factor in order for her to earn her premium back before she starts to make a profit. Yes. Okay. So the question is, you buy this um, option here for the for a dollar, the original example we had, and uh, so that's where the the option was at the money. Um, and you're hoping the price goes up, but it doesn't. It starts to sag. Okay, So if the price sags to 28, 27, 25, well, your premium is the value is eroding very quickly. right? And your question is, could you turn around and sell it? Well, you could recover some of your money, uh, depending on how quickly the premium eroded. Um, you know, If it went down to 25 cents, you could sell it for 25 cents and recoup a quarter of your premium. So the answer is yes. But you'll see when we look at options prices, as we get near the expiry date, for an option that's out of the money, that would be out of the money. It's, it's at the money in our example. You said if prices go down, then it's out of the money. Um, this, this is in the money because her strike is less than the futures price. You know, She could exercise it and get a $5 return. So if it's out of the money, uh, some of those uh, premiums drop off quickly and they're really only worth a few cents. So you can always try to recover some of it. So um, we've indicated what the risks are. For the buyer, if you buy a call, you're buying the right to go long, you can exercise it or you may not. For the buyer of a put, you're buying the right to go short, and it's the same thing. We could just reverse our examples here. You, you think prices are going down, you buy a put option. If they do fall, either you exercise your option or you turn around and sell the option. If they don't and they rise, well, it's worthless. You throw it away. Um, so that's the difference between a call and a put. And we've discussed the difference between a buyer and a seller. The seller of the option is called the writer of the option. So the writer of the option um, is exposed to significant risk, not unlike the buyer or seller of a futures contract. However, they obtain the premium up front. And you know, in Sarah's case, the, the premium was the most she could lose. 
as the writer of an option, I'm selling it to her, the premium is the most that I could make. That's my maximum profit. And in the best of worlds for me, I, I'm really secretly hoping that she's going to throw that option in her fireplace, right? That's the best outcome for me. If she throws it in her fireplace, I keep her premium. Anything else uh, is going to erode the premium. So that's the most profit I can make. Yes? So if the writer of the option is kind of speculating that the, it won't be, he does the calculations and he's speculating that it won't be covered. Right. It won't move into money or uh, move higher into money. Absolutely. <laughs> there, there are also some hedging reasons to, to write options, but we don't really have time to get into those in this class, but you're right about the speculators. Yes? The market, right? I mean, Sarah's in the pit, I'm in the trading pit. She's trying to buy, I'm trying to sell. It's, we go back and forth until we, it's just like the futures contract. Is there a percentage of how often the writer, um, you know, set up, comes out ahead? Uh, I'm sure there is, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a very competitive market, though. As I said, the premiums have come down. And we'll talk about something called the Black-Scholes uh, formula, which uh, calculates a, a fair premium. And uh, in many of these markets, you'll find that um, the, the actual premium is very close to what the Black-Scholes would say it ought to be, which is based on a competitive assumption. You know, because it's, uh, it's pretty easy to estimate some of the uh, statistical properties of these prices and to come up with a probability that price of oil is going up or down. And, um, so there are lots of professional speculators who make their money writing options. And if, you know, if there's a, a lot of money on the table, you notice your neighbor who's an options writer all of a sudden has bought a, a bigger house and a bigger boat. I mean, you, you start moving over to that pit to see what's going on, right? Um, so we've explained the difference between the calls and the puts. Uh, you can either buy a call or buy a put, or you can write a call or write a put. And like in the futures market, for every buyer there has to be a seller. So if you're buying an option, somebody has to sell it to you. And as we've just discussed, that price is established in the pit. Okay. Uh, we've already talked about these components, I think, with these examples. You have a buyer and a seller for every contract. Uh, there has to be some underlying futures contract with a delivery date. The strike price is set by the exchange. Are you clear on the strike price now? You had a question about that? Okay. Um, and it, the exchange will add or, sub well, not often subtract, but typically add strike prices if the market's moving in one direction. And really, the traders want to trade at a new strike price. It's up to where the traders want to be at. Um, and of course, they all have expiry dates. And the premium is set in the trading pit. Um, so what can happen to an option? Well, it's possible that nothing happens. We've discussed this. That's where you, where you throw it in the fireplace. Um, you can exercise the option, so you can do nothing if it's worthless. If you exercise it, then you obtain either the long or short position, depending whether you bought a call or a put. If you bought a call, the clearinghouse gives you a long position at the strike price. If you bought a call, the clearinghouse gives you a long position at the strike price. If you bought a put, the clearinghouse gives you a short position at the strike price. If you buy a put, you go short at the strike price once it's exercised. Okay? Or you could offset it. That was the question over here in the corner. Um, can you turn around and sell it? The answer is yes in, in US markets. In some other markets and other parts of the world, in particular in Europe, uh, it's not always possible to sell the option before the expiry date. Uh, you buy the option and you either exercise it or you don't. And so that will be priced somewhat differently. Okay? Matisha's here. I'm going to hand back the quiz.